Well, you'll be happy to know, and well, maybe you won't be happy to know, I forgot to write a quiz for today. Uh, so it's like, oh, I could have skipped class today. Right? Well, okay. I wanted to write a, I wanted to write a quiz today. I just forgot. I was busy with other things. So uh, instead of there being 26 quizzes overall for the whole semester, there'll be 25 instead. I still will drop your six lowest quizzes. I haven't done that yet, by the way, on Moodle. I haven't actually told Moodle to drop your six lowest quizzes. I'll do that closer to the end. When I do that, you should all expect your quiz scores to go up, to go up then. Um, so we'll do that closer to the end. Uh, and we will have quizzes definitely from each class from now on. And I, I won't forget them. I'm promising myself I won't forget them. Okay? If we had had a quiz today, it would have been you know, on everything else that we've done to this point, you know, leading up to the exam on Tuesday. Um, a few of your exams are graded. I, I focused on grading exams of people who were struggling more first and getting the scores on Moodle. So if you are somebody who was struggling more, your exam may be graded and your score is on Moodle. And for a few of you, I think maybe three or four of you, of you I also fill out course progress reports. Uh, to indicate that you're maybe getting a D or you're not passing and you should consider whether you want to stay in the course or not and tomorrow is the last day to drop so you might want to talk with, with, uh, with me about it after class and we can discuss whether or not you feel like you can stay in the course. Um, the plan here in the lectures that we have left today, next Tuesday we have a lecture and then after that, just four more, so six more lectures total here. First half of today is we're going to review things in Chapter 8. I did not make Chapter 8 a real big part of the exam. It was on the exam, but not real heavily. So I think it would be good to review Chapter 8 about proportions. And then Lecture B, we're going to review what we did in Chapter 2 with regard to linear regression. And hopefully the last five or ten minutes also talk about something a little extra that's new in chapter 10. We're going to skip over chapter 9 for today. Well, we are going to actually talk about chapter 9 next Tuesday. I wasn't originally planning to necessarily do chapter 9, but I think it would be worthwhile to try to fit it in. It's a pretty different kind of topic, but it's pretty useful. And so I think it would be worthwhile to try to fit that in. But today, we're lecture A is chapter 8. Lecture 9 is the start of chapter 10. Chapter 10 will be the last chapter overall that we do. All right, so let's go to those proportion problems. And we're, what we're going to focus on here is testing, hypothesis testing. We did do confidence intervals both for estimating single proportions from a population and also for estimating the difference of two population proportions. Today, here in Lecture A, let's focus on doing tests those situations. So same examples as before. This example was about um, are your shipments on time for your company? Look at the details here. You are selecting a simple random sample. Where does it say that? A simple random sample of 200 orders from the past month for an audit. And the audit is revealing that 164 of these were shipped on time. Okay. So the relevant quantity there is a proportion. What fraction, what proportion, what ratio, what percentage, those are all basically synonyms. All the orders were shipped on time. For the sample, that's easy. We call it P hat. P hat is the sample proportion. The book writes the formula as x over n, where x is the number of successes out of n trials, success here being the order shipped on time. You've got 164 out of 200. That is going to be 0.82, 82% as a percentage of the orders were shipped on time. We're going to focus on the test here, part C. Do you have statistically significant evidence that the true population proportion of orders that are shipped on time overall is greater than 
Certainly the fact that the sample proportion is bigger than 75% is some evidence against the null hypothesis that the true population proportion is 75%. The issue is, is it statistically significant evidence? Double under on the map there. What's the p-value? Can we reject the null at typical kinds of levels of significance? All right, you remember, uh, do we use Z or T here? By the way, we will take a break today, so we'll make it a shorter break, like seven minutes instead of ten. Do you use Z or T? Z. Z, yeah. Proportions, we go back to using normal curves. In chapter seven, with means, we were using T distributions. When we had to use S, the sample standard deviation. In chapter 10, we'll go back to using T again. And in chapter 9, we're going to use something different altogether. But here we use Z. The Z statistic, well, we should set up our hypotheses first. We forgot to do that. Let's let P, you should define your population parameter that you're going to test, be the population proportion of orders shipped on time. We are taking a simple random sample from that. You know, and that proportion could change over time as your, as your company improves its system. But, you know, for the sake of just concreteness, pretend this is the population proportion of orders shipped on time over an entire year or something, or over a month. We're just doing a simple random sample of orders in the past month. It's not a big deal if you add the, the phrase past month or not here, unless I specifically said to focus on that. In actuality, if all this stuff is in the computer, we probably can find the exact population proportion if we restrict ourselves to orders just in the last month. But we are doing a sample so we can use inferential, inferential statistics methods. What's the null hypothesis? Based on the problem phrasing, we want to see if we have sufficient evidence that the true population proportion is greater than 75%, so the alternative is going to be right tail. P is bigger than 0.75. The null then is that P is equal to 0.75. In actuality, it's probably better to think of it as less than or equal to 0.75 for a right tail test here. But for simplicity, simplicity we go ahead and put equal sign there. The Z statistic that you calculate takes the sample proportion P hat and subtracts the null value P0 and divides by the standard error for what? What do you think? X bar? If, there, if we were doing a test for a mean, we would divide by the standard error of x bar, but we're doing this test for a proportion. P hat, yeah. And not P. P hat. P is a number, a fixed number, or at least we're imagining it to be. Even though in reality it could conceivably change over time. We're imagining P to be fixed. It doesn't have a sampling distribution. It's p hat that does. And the standard error for p hat then is approximating the standard deviation of that sampling distribution, which looks like a normal curve. p sub 0, that's the null value. In this case, that's 0.75. So now I'll go ahead and plug the numbers in. 0.82 minus 0.75. But what's the standard error for p hat? That's the square root of careful. We're assuming the null is true when we do the test. So actually here we don't use the value of p hat when we calculate this. We use the null value of p. p0 times 1 minus p0 over n. So it's not a standard error cal calculated in the usual way. We don't use p hat because when you do the test, when you calculate z, when you calculate the p value, you assume the null is true. So you might as well use that assumed value of p. 
in this case, square root of 0.75 times 0.25 divided by n. What is n here? n is 200. When you do confidence intervals, then you use p hat, because there is no null hypothesis, right? The confidence intervals, there's no null hypothesis. You're not doing hypothesis test testing, at least initially. So you use p hat. Here you use the null value, 0.75. All right, let's use the calculators. You can have your calculator out and calculate with me. 0.75 times 0.25, divide by 200. There it is. Technically, that's scientific notation on the calculator. As a decimal, that would be 0.000, 0 0.000935. You'd be taking the square root of that to get the standard error that we divide by when we calculate the z-stat. Don't forget to take the square root. You can raise it to the 0.5 power. So the standard error is about 0 0.0306. Go ahead and, well, some people were not doing this on the test. Keep as many decimal places as you can and only round at the very end. Some people were rounding too soon and it was leading to errors at the end. <coughs> In, you know, for example, when I say round your final answer to three decimal places, some people were off because they were rounding too soon. This is too many significant digits, but when you're doing the calculations, you want to keep as much as you can, sort of just being extra careful about it, and only rounding at the end. So there's your standard error. That's what you divide by here. The numerator is 0 0.07. So do 0 0.07 divided by what we just found, 0 0.07 divided by 0 0.0306. Now you can round that z is approximately 2.29. Right? The 0 0.0306 is the standard error. What we were dividing by, 0 0.07 divided by that is 2.29 approximately. And you can round that to 2.29 because in the table, the z's are only rounded to two decimal places. So that's your z stat. It's kind of extreme. Anything bigger than two is kind of extreme. We're going to get a p-value that's fairly small. So I'm guessing we're probably going to reject the null. Two point two nine. Here's 2.2, have your book with you and look this up, 2.29. The p-value, well the number to the left, the area to the left of 2.29, this is a 0 0.9890, but we want an area to the right. It's a right-tailed test. The p-value for this right-tailed test is the probability that z is bigger than 2.29 that's approximately 1 minus 0 0.9890, 0 0.011, 1 1.1%, less than your typical 5%. Uh, we would reject them all at the 5% level of significance. Technically not at the 1% level of significance, but remember, you're so close to 1% that it's kind of like, really, should you really play hard and fast by that 1% rule? Especially if you're making a decision about your business here. I guess I would say this is pretty strong evidence that our on-time percentage has gone up from what it was in the past, 75% say, or from what we think it might have been. But we're looking to see if we improve. We've got pretty strong evidence against the building. Can I clarify anything? Let's do a test comparing two proportions. So this goes back to the uh, water supply and whether it caused birth defects. This example. In Woburn, Massachusetts, again, not Woburn, Woburn, 
Oh, I probably should tell you the story of the cab driver. It, it was a cab driver who said Uber. This was a pretty crazy cab driver in Boston. So he's taking me from the airport out to Woburn, which is like, I don't know, 20 miles away. And the freeway is just packed. So he's like, oh, I'm going to take some side streets. I better not try to approximate Boston accent. Okay? It was a very strong Boston accent. Uh, he's like, I'm going to take side streets. Avoid the freeway. So we're taking side streets through the city. Then we come to this park area. Okay? Wide open space. And he's driving through it. And I see ahead, there's another road crossing our road, and there's no stoplight or there's no stop sign. I casually look to the left, and I see there's another cab coming toward the intersection, and I'm quickly estimating we're going to be at the intersection at about the same time. I look at my cab driver. I see he notices the other cab. All of a sudden, jerk ahead. He hits the accelerator. I'm watching the other cab. I can tell that cab driver hit the accelerator too. So we're cruising toward this intersection. Who's going to win? We won. My heart was racing. Okay. That was my experience with the cab driver in Boston. I have no idea why that intersection would not have a stop time or a stop light. Didn't make any sense. All right. Um, anyway, coming back here. There's two population proportions to compare. The population proportion of birth defects for women who drank from the uh, contaminated well water and those who didn't. Maybe instead of using a subscript one and two, maybe we should use suggestive subscripts. Like P sub C for contaminated and P sub what? C, clean would be starting with a C as well. Uh, I'll just put C for piece of W for water, pure water. Okay. So C represents contaminated water. W represents uncontaminated water. Population proportion of birth defects for for women who drank the contaminated water and P sub W is going to be the population proportion of birth defects for women who drank the uncontaminated water. Clean water, I don't know if that water is ever clean or pure completely, right? There's always some impurities in it. <clears throat> Again, we're kind of in a situation where it doesn't necessarily make much sense to distinguish between the sample and the population. Because maybe this is all the births that there were during the periods of time. So it's not necessarily the best situation to do inference in. <coughs> I suppose we could if we imagine that other women who did not have babies during this time period could have had babies, and those babies could have had birth defects or not. Okay, so if you kind of imagine the population being wider that way, you might get justified inference a little bit more. Or maybe you have other cities who have that have similar well water uh, issues, and you're thinking about comparing proportions for those, although there are other issues that's it's really not, it's not a random sample from that wider population. So again, inference is not completely ideal here. And I suppose you should realize that and trying to apply this in real life, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. The no hypothesis is that PC equals PW. Last time we looked at this problem, we just found, it a con found a confidence interval for the difference. Here we're going to do a hypothesis test. What's the alternative? Well, you would think, your theory would be that for women who drank the contaminated water, the birth defects would be a, occur at a higher rate. PC is greater than PW. These hypotheses can be written in an equivalent way. <clears throat> For 
focused on the difference between these proportions, the null hypothesis can be that PC minus PW is zero, and the alternative hypothesis is that PC minus PW is greater than zero. Those two sets of hypotheses mean the same thing. State your hypotheses like this. That makes more sense as far as stating them. But as far as actually doing the test, it's better to think of them this way. Because then we can calculate one statistic, one estimator for this difference, and focus on the corresponding Z statistic for that one statistic, PC hat minus PW hat. The formula for the Z statistic that we're going to calculate to do the test is the difference PC hat minus PW hat, technically minus PC minus PW. However, the null hypothesis is that PC minus PW is zero. So in effect, we're really subtracting zero, which means I don't really need to write that, but I'll write it anyway. That's really PC minus PW, the null values. Maybe put a subscript of zero there. You don't have to write that. You don't even have to write that. I'm doing it for conceptual clarity here initially. And divide by a corresponding standard error. You noticing a pattern in all these things? Whether it's Z or T, it's the same pattern. We've got an estimator minus a null value divided by a standard error. That pattern is going to continue in chapter 10 as well, though not in chapter 9. This kind of pattern, estimator minus null value divided by standard error, is a common way to calculate test statistics like Z or T. Standardized, essentially. All right, what are these proportions? Let's get the calculator to calculate them quickly here. PC hat is 16 out of 414, right? Look at the numbers in the problem description there. For the contaminated well, <coughs> this well is contaminated. 16 out of 414 birth defects. PW hat is for the uncontaminated water, 3 out of 228, which is definitely a lower sample proportion. So there's the two sample proportions. You can write those numbers down. P, PC hat is 0 0.03864733. PW hat is 0 0.01315789847. We now want to calculate the difference. The first number minus the second one, 0 0.03864743 minus 0 0.01315789847. The difference is that, you can write that number down. That would be what goes up here in the numerator. That difference is 0 0.02548944834. Minus zero means that's going to be the numerator. What's this standard error? This is the trickiest part here. The standard error for a difference of two proportions, we did see before, I did talk about a confidence interval in this context. Let me write it on the board. Here's what I wrote for the standard error of P1 hat minus P2 hat. We did use this to compute a confidence interval. I guess a week ago. Actually, the notation the book uses here for the hypothesis testing is a little different. They put a subscript that they call DP here. What in the world is that? The D stands for difference. What does the P stand for? Um, we've got so many P's in this class. What? P 
p-value, probability, what else, proportions. This p here doesn't mean any of those things, actually. It means pooled. What? Pooled? Yeah, this is a standard error related to something called a pooled proportion. Take your two sample proportions and essentially combine them in a weighted average where the weights depend on N1 and N2. The formula for the pooled proportion, I'll explain why we're doing this in a second. The symbol for it is just a plain p hat in this situation. It's to take x1 plus x2 and divide by n1 plus n2. Why are we doing that? What is that doing? That's essentially pooling the two separate independent samples together into one big sample of size 414 plus 228, which would be what, 642? One big sample and counting the total number of successes, quote unquote. Success here is a birth defect, so it's bad. x1 plus x2, 16 plus 3 for the numerator. Why do this? The reason is because with hypothesis testing, we're assuming the null is true when we do the test. When we do the z calculation and the p value calculation, we assume the null is true, so we're assuming p, c, and p, w are equal. So you may as well combine the samples to get the best possible estimate for their, their value that they're equal to if you're assuming they're equal. So in this case, again, that's 16 plus 3 divided by 414 plus 228. That's going to be 19 over 642. It's not going to be halfway between 0 0.0386 and 0 0.01316. Because the first one has a bigger sample size, 414 compared to 228. So it's going to be closer to the top one than it is to the bottom one. It's going to be really a, what's called a weighted average. Let's see what it ends up being. 19 divided by 642, 0 0.02595. 0.029595. Use that as your best estimate for these values when you assume they're equal. And then use that best estimate back here in place of both P1 hat and P2 hat, which really results in a slightly simpler formula, although it looks kind of weird for this thing, since you're plugging in the same number p hat in place of p1 hat and p2 hat, you can actually factor out those common factors because they're going to be the same thing, like this. And this formula is technically slightly quicker to use once you calculate the full proportion. Let's go ahead and use it now. Check this with me on your calculator. There is the pooled proportion, 0 0.029595. Multiply that times 1 minus itself. That's the p hat times 1 minus p hat part of the formula. Okay. Then, Look at the formula again. We've got to multiply that by the sum of 1 over n1 and 1 over n2, which I, if I want to do it at once on a calculator, I can do it like this. Take that preceding answer. answer. Go 1 divided by 414 plus 1 divided by 228. The calculator should know to do the order of operations correctly. Find those fractions first, then add them, and then multiply if you use parentheses in this way, should do it right. 
There's the thing that goes under the square root. Now we take the square root of that to get the standard error for the pool difference. SE DP is this number. So all this, this whole thing here, double subscript there, SE sub D sub P, ends up being approximately 0 0.01397609. Now divide, and you can round to two decimal places after you divide. Point zero two five four eight nine four four eight three divide by what we just calculated. Z is about one point eight two. Z is about one point eight two. The right tail P value then will be the probability of Z being bigger than one point eight two. This is this is the observed z value. You got to put that in there now and find the probability. Technically speaking, this z is a variable, whereas this is a, an observed particular value of z. Go back to table A once again. Look for z is 1.82. Point six nine six five six is what that says. So the p value is going to be one minus that. One minus point nine six five six point zero three four four. Pretty small. We've got pretty strong evidence against the null hypothesis that the population proportions are equal. It seems that we have pretty good evidence in favor of the alternative that the population proportion of birth defects for the contaminated water is higher than the population proportion of birth defects for the uncontaminated water. Okay? All right, let's take our seven-minute break with no quiz today.